You know, it was a, uh, uh, probably for over a century, uh, she was uh, vilified as the one who caused the big fire in the Windy City, who uh, were over uh, 300 people died, over 100,000 people were left uh, homeless, and uh, of course that was uh, Catherine, Catherine O'Leary, an Irish immigrant born back in the 1820s, but on that night, October 8, 1871, just six years after the Civil War ended, that, uh, you know, if it hadn't been for the events of that night, she probably wouldn't even be known at all, you know, to this day. But on that day, it was, uh, uh, it was in the evening, and Chicago at that time was uh, uh, still a fairly new city. Uh, in fact, they were calling it probably maybe the fastest growing city in the world, and uh, it would, had been put together, kind of built up in haste, uh, made entirely, uh, pretty much out of, much of it out of wood and tightly packed together. And it had been a uh, scorcher of a summer that in 1871. Already they'd had over 20 fires in Chicago. But on this one now, October 8th, and uh, it was all the, uh, it was in the fall, and so everybody's uh, barns were packed with uh, animal feed and filled with, uh, you know, you know every, grains, everything they needed for the uh, winter. It had been a very windy day, and it was about 9 p.m. when Daniel Pegleg Sullivan, sounds like a pirate's name, you know, Pegleg. But anyway, he noticed flames uh, dancing in O'Leary's barn. And it took another 20 minutes before the um, fire engines, you know, firemen could get there. And by then it already, because of the wind, spread across the street and was spreading very rapidly. And they said that what occurred, that it, they called it a fire whirl. And because of the strong winds, the fire formed like a tornado of flames and was moving very, very quickly. And the people on the other side of the Chicago River thought the river would, be a, would stop it. Uh, but what had happened was that the river was so polluted with oil that the fire just went right across the river and kept going. And so the uh, mayor was uh, begging for the surrounding towns to send people to help. And uh, they even let some prisoners out to come help fight the flames. And it took them all, the re all night long, the rest of the next day, and they finally got it under control. And, but it took several more days before things cooled down and they could start assessing the damage. And they said over, uh, not like I mentioned, not only 300 people died, but they said in today's dollars, it would have done about $4 billion worth of damage, property damage. And it wasn't uh, too long after that, they started wondering, well, who did it? Uh, who... Uh, you know, who can we point the finger at to cause this? Because much of uh, Chicago just was in ashes now. And it didn't take too long before they pointed at Catherine, Catherine O'Leary. And the story goes, the legend goes, allegedly she was out in her barn milking her cow, and the cow kicked over a lantern and started the fire, and that's how it all got started. And uh, the very uh, distraught woman uh, always said that is not the case, that never happened. She said, why would I be milking my car at nine in the evening, in the, you know? She said, no, I was, I was in bed that whole evening. And some thought, well, maybe Daniel Pegleg Sullivan started it, and he just pointed you know, the finger at her, so he wouldn't get the blame. And actually it wasn't uh, uh, until 19, uh, uh, or later towards the end of that 19th century, that a journalist came out and admitted that the whole thing about Catherine O'Leary starting it was, was a hoax, and, uh, but the legend lived on, and, and it was in 1942 when a businessman, anyway, from Chicago, he was laying on his deathbed, and he finally admitted, he said, that fire got started when me and some of my teenage buddies were playing cards in O'Leary's barn, and we, we started it. But and then it was in 1997, not that long ago, when the city of Chicago officially exonerated Catherine O'Leary and said, we now know it was not her who did it. But still the story lives on, that it was her and her cow and kicking over the lantern. But, so you have that huge fire, and the, but the point I share all this and, and uh, um, what I wanted to share from that was how it affected especially one guy, and that of course would have been D.L. Moody. And he, uh, a great evangelist at the time, 
And he was, that was uh, Sunday night, October 8, 1871, and he was speaking to the largest crowd he'd ever spoken to there in Chicago. And he was going on, the message of his title was this, um, what shall I do then with Jesus who had called the Christ? And at the conclusion of his message, he said, I wish you would take this text home with you and turn it over in your minds during the week and next Sunday we'll come to Calvary and the cross and we will decide then what to do with Jesus. And then his song leader, Ira, Ira DeSanke, uh, you know, we still have some of his hymns in the hymn book, uh, got up to sing. Uh, the name of his song, or the, some of the words of it were, uh, uh, Today the Savior calls for refuge fly, the storm of justice falls and death is nigh. But he never finished the hymn because the sounds of the fire engines going by drowned out the uh, song and everybody rushed out to see what was going on. And of course, during that night, even uh, Moody's own church, his own house burned to the ground. And uh, again, like I mentioned, most of uh, Chicago was in ashes. But the point was this, to his dying day, Mr. Moody regretted what he had done that evening. And by when he told him, come next Sunday, and then we'll decide what to do with Jesus. And he said this, he wrote this, he said, I have never since dared to give an audience a week to think about their salvation. If they were lost, they might rise up in judgment against me. I have never seen that, that group since, and I will never meet those people until I meet them in another world. But I want to tell you of one lesson that I learned that night, which I have never forgotten, and that is, when I preach, to press Christ upon the people then and there and try to bring them to a decision on the spot. I would rather have that right hand cut off than to give an audience a week now to decide what to do with Jesus. See, Moody was an evangelist, and uh, he went on and became a very uh, effective traveling evangelist, and he learned this lesson, never give him time. Call for a decision that night, or that, that, at that time. But you know what? Today we face too, in many lives, there is a, almost a spirit of indifference amongst uh, many. Uh, you know, kind of like the Moody before this great Chicago fire. You know, we always think, well, they're always, you know, they'll be, I'll speak to them tomorrow. Uh, or, you know, I'll talk to my family later about spiritual things. But sometimes that later day never comes. You know, even here, none of us have a guarantee we'll be here next Sunday. We don't know. And so may our prayer be, you know, ever in this church, Lord, please help me to see the urgency of winning people to Christ. And if there's someone here, you know, who hasn't made that decision, today would be a very good day to do so, to confess your sins and place your faith in Christ. You know, this is not a time in our culture uh, to stay quiet, even though a lot of critics are saying, you know, keep quiet about your faith, you know, just... You know, keep it to yourself. Keep it private. Don't bring it out into public. And it's not a time to keep quiet because, for one, they're not doing so. They're not being quiet. Every day they're proclaiming their godless faith and, and through many, and we see it in the news articles, they're not being quiet. And second, Jesus has given us the command to save the lost. He's, in fact, in Luke 19.10, he says, I came to seek and to save the lost, all those who haven't place their trust in Christ. And so we need to follow his command. And so this church, you know, and, and each of us, because we are the church, you know, what, what we are doing is what the church is doing. Um, need to be an evangelistic people who take advantage of the opportunities God gives us each week as we're out there mixing and, you know, with people, the opportunities that come, we need to take full advantage of that. We always need to have that kind of an outward focus. If a church, be, when a church or any church gains an inward focus and we're, you know, just concerned about ourselves, the church starts to die at that point. An individual, if that's their focus, that individual, their spiritual life starts to die at that point. So, I mean, and we can't draw people to Christ. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But we can exalt, we can honor, we can proclaim Christ and lift him up. Like Jesus said, if I be lifted up, he said, in other words, if we exalt him, he says, then I will draw all men to myself. That's something he can do. Well, actually, okay, I just kind of gave part of my, uh, 
uh, annual report, uh, but I'll, so I'll get back to the message here. But Psalm 11, uh, let's, let's take a look at that. You know, because all of us probably can relate to Moody's burden in some way. And, you know, almost without exception, does a month go by without we hear about another tragedy, whether it be another suicide bombing or another rampage at a school, you know, amongst the students, or um, uh, whether it's another, you know, uh, car, car bombing or another murder of a police officer uh, or another city that ISIS is, you know, seeking to destroy. You know, we're forced to consider, where's God in all this? You know, how much time is left? And we look for the right words to say to, to calm and comfort and encourage, you know, our family or our kids or our friends. You know, what do we say in light of all these tragedies? And so, you know, what can we say to give hope uh, in these chaotic times? And David had his share of calamities too. In fact, we will read a little bit of it here in Psalm 11. Let me read uh, the first uh, few verses. Uh, Psalm 11, it says... Uh, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted the arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the children of man. I'll stop there. You know, back in uh, 2003, there was a, uh, 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 more than 20 people lost their lives in a fire in California. And uh, because the fire started and it just, it just spread so quickly, it spread faster than they could flee. And, uh, and some of the people complained that they didn't get a warning early enough. Uh, his name is Sergeant uh, Conrad Grayson. This was reported in a USA Today article the name of the article was uh, Hesitation Can Be a Fatal Mistake. And he said this, we're begging people to leave and they don't take us seriously. The ones who listened to me left the area and they lived. The ones who didn't, they died. You know, the wise response to a terrible warning like that is to flee. Especially if you hear a forest fire is coming your way, yes, you want to flee right away. But what are we to do when it's the circumstances of our lives that are like a, you know, world of flame. You know, when you want to flee, and you feel like fleeing, but you can't flee, what do you do then? You know, Psalm 11 was written by David in a very uh, trying time in his life. Uh, it, was, it was a time when it almost seemed like his life was spiraling out of control. This is a time when uh, Saul was after him. You know, he had a group of men who were trying to find him and kill him. I mean, imagine how you would feel if you knew, you know, every day you wake up and uh, you knew there was a large squadron group of men who their only job that day was to find you and then quickly kill you. I mean, talk about stress. And this is some of what David was, was facing and he faced it at different times. But, you know, David's words show us uh, in that situation that the great contrast between the reality of fear and the confidence in, of faith. And we'll see some of that here in this psalm. You know, David uh, uh, had apparently received word from a close advisor, uh, you know, with all this going, flee, you know, run, uh, run for the hills, protect yourself. And uh, David didn't do that. Instead, he paused and he asked, I think, a very insightful question. And it's that in verse 3, it says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? It's a good question. Uh, you know, foundations, we're very familiar with foundations. You know, the dictionary defines foundation as the basis upon which something stands or is supported. I mean, we're all familiar with houses have to have, you know, are supported by a strong foundation and, you know, skyscrapers are supported by a very deep and very strong foundation to support all that weight. And so, you know, if you do, we know if you destroy the foundation, the building will crumble. These are things we know. Uh, you know, and even in the Middle East, we see some of this going on today. Uh, it's kind of interesting. ISIS has developed this very devious strategy of moving into a village and basically destroying the foundations. And by that, I mean they, they move into an area 
and uh, you know historical monuments get blown up. Uh, a lot of their art gets destroyed. A lot of their uh, you know ancient architecture gets destroyed. Um, and so they uh, you know historical you know documents those types of things. So not only do they purposely change the landscape of an area, but by doing so it really changes the the psyche of the people there too, because in a sense they're their foundations are being erased. Um, their past is being wiped out. And it has quite an effect on them. In fact, we know the, in fact, the Muslims have been doing that for years in Israel, trying to destroy any you know, archeological sites and, uh, that help show that, uh, that the Israelis, that the Jews have been there for thousands of years. And they're trying to destroy a lot of that so they can say, no, this is, this has always been Muslim lands. This has never been Jewish lands. This is our land. And so that we see kind of the same thing going on even to this day, not only in Israel, but even in other parts of the Middle East. And even in America, I mean, a number of our history books, you know, the history books that kids are reading now in school are not like history books you read when, you know, you were in school. They've been altered quite a bit. Uh, a lot of things that we would have thought important are entirely missing, are left out, other things are put in and put in from a little different perspective. And even some history books now are being written from a, an Islamic perspective. And, uh, or, um, uh, you know, not, not, not only that, but just uh, coming at things just, for, you know, so that people see things a little different. You know, other preferences. Uh, you could say the foundations are being destroyed. And, but again, if our foundations could, you know, will remain strong, then the building and us as people can remain strong too. So I have point two there on the sheet if you're following along. Faith is our foundation. I mean, that's David's point here in Psalm 11. Faith is our foundation. He's not referring here to a literal structure. He's not talking about works of art or a literal you know, foundation or our history. He's talking about standing, being able to stand firm when, when our world seems to be crumbling around us, when the world seems on fire when we feel like we'd rather just flee. Uh, it's a world of flame. He's talking about being able to stand firm. And the righteous, he says, what can the righteous do? The righteous he's referring to here are the people who are considered righteous, not because of their good works. The Bible's very clear. No man could be ever considered righteous in God's eyes because of their good works. You couldn't do enough of them. Uh, nobody will be saved by their good works. Uh, Good works are very important as a uh, showing that we have faith in Christ and doing those things. But a person is considered righteous because of their faith in Christ, in God's only begotten Son. That's who the righteous are. And, you know, so if the foundation crumbles, the life falls apart. But if the foundation stands strong, no amount of stress. Or in David's case, being chased by King Saul or uh, later, you know, backstabbed by uh, his son Absalom can make his life fall apart. So, again, David view is interesting. He gives kind of a very vivid word picture as he describes these. In verse 2, he says, uh, he compares the wicked to like bending the bow. You know, and they got the arrows and, and they, uh, they hang out in the dark and they're, you know, they're, they're waiting in the dark shadows, lurking there to shoot at the righteous. Again, very vivid uh, picture. And in many ways, too, what, quite a comparison and metaphor for what's going on today for our time as well. I mean, we face a constant barrage of unseen, spontaneous, we don't know where they're going to attack next, you know, attacks from these per uh, terrorists or suicide bombers and, you know, so much more. They're lurking in the shadows and waiting to strike again. That's what evil does. But we can relate to David's visors who tell him to run for your lives, flee to the hills, in fear and panic. But David was going to have none of that. Instead, he strengthened his resolve. He's going to respond in faith, not in fear. And we see his faith expressed in verse 1 and verse 4. He says, in the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to me, flee like a bird? And again in verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see. And his eyes, his eyelids test the children of men. You know, what a great affirmation of his faith. And a great affirmation that we can make along too. 
uh, with them. I mean, David was not going to run. You know, he, fu- he refused to just melt away in panic. He wasn't going to do that. Uh, his, his refuge was the Lord. A refuge is a safe place, a place of protection. Um, in Hebrew, the word is uh, kasah. Uh, again, it just means a refuge, a, a, a place of safety. It's kind of like a firewall against anxiety and fear. It's a, a refuge. David made it clear that, his, that the Lord is his kasah, is his refuge. And so if our foundation of trust is in the Lord, then it, it won't crumble. Because even though David was just a man, the Lord is not just a man. And he can, you can trust the man who died for you on the cross. He's worthy of our trust. One old country preacher is right when he put it this way. He said, I may tremble on the rock, but the rock don't tremble under me. That's how he put it. That's real good. And uh, this great confidence that David had, this great affirmation of faith, can be our affirmation too. Can be our confidence. It wasn't just for him. It's for us too. Uh, that if we build our lives on that kind of foundation of faith, you know, that's something we can take with us wherever we go. So whether you're laying in a lonely hospital bed, whether it's in the dark, whether you're in a foreign land, Still, your foundation is strong because your foundation is faith in God, and he's still there. And so that enables us to stand firm. You know, and David used that same word in Psalm 46.1, and we looked at that just briefly last week, where it says, God is our refuge. There's that same word, the kasah, and our strength. And then he attaches a great promise to it, a very present help in times of trouble. And, I mean, who couldn't find comfort from words like that? I mean, those are the same words that brought great hope and comfort to that old reformer, Martin Luther, 500 years ago. And when he was being persecuted, when he was being constantly misunderstood, misquoted, uh, you know, mistreated, he found comfort and hope in Psalm 46.1, the Lord is my refuge. So much so that he went on and he wrote these words uh, and, and others with it. It inspired him to write, A high tower is the Lord our God. In fact, we sing those familiar lyrics in a great hymn, A mighty fortress is our God, which Luther wrote based on Psalm 46. The Lord is our refuge. And so it brought him great comfort, and it still brings us great comfort to this day too. And we could ask, why is such a foundation so strong? Why is such a foundation so impervious to enemy attacks? Why is that? Why is that the case? Because our mighty fortress is God himself. Our foundation is faith in that almighty God. I mean, let, you know, let us see him, let, you know, let us see you know, others put him to flight. Let us see them even cause him to even to be flustered for a moment. Uh, he sits, our God sits on the throne. And uh, no man, it says, no man can say to him, what are you doing? Or to try to stop him from what he's doing. In fact, it even says in Psalm 2 that he, he looks upon the nations and he laughs at them. Any moment he wants, he could deal with any nation, any, just like a thumb under our ant, not even feel it. In fact, it would be even easier than that for him. That's why our refuge, our foundation is so strong. And that if your life is built on that, you will not crumble when the stresses of life come. Or wherever you find yourself, in a hospital bed, in Iraq, wherever. Because God is there. He's our foundation. Well, and not only that, he's our loving Heavenly Father. I mean, I like the question, what kind of, there used to be a song with that in its phrase, uh, one of his phrases in it, what kind of a father do you think I am? Uh, you know, our, if even our earthly fathers would protect us, you know, how much more so are would our Heavenly Father, who loves us way more even, and so we can trust him. There's another great old song, How Firm Our Foundation. And there's a line in that that goes, The flame shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. It's kind of like that quote I mentioned last week too, where one guy said, you know, it's funny, because we ask God to change our situation, but we discover that God put us in that situation to change us. Very often we find that to be true. Well, you know, our bedrock foundation again is the God who revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ, the God who made us, 
the God who saves us, the God who delivers us from danger, uh, who calms our fears in tough times. He is our refuge. He is our safety. He is our protector. You know, our need is to look to him and to trust him. Just like it says in Psalm 91, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. You know, that is a foundation that will not crumble. On that solid foundation, you know, by unfaith, then we are secure. We find help. We find hope in God. Trust him. Trust him. No matter what comes this week, trust him. You can trust this, guy, this man who died for you. And it shows his great love for us. Even when the world around us might seem like it's in flames, trust him. That's a firm foundation. Well, let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, again, we thank you again for your word and for the great hope and encouragement it gives us that you are our foundation. As David said, what can the righteous do if the foundation is destroyed? And we have people today who are trying to destroy the, our past and the great heritage that we have. And yet, Lord, that's not our foundation. Our foundation is in you. And that's solid bedrock. And that's a firm, uh, firm ground on which to stand, no matter where we are and no matter what our circumstances are like. So, Lord, help us in this new week to trust you and to keep relying on you by faith. We don't need to fear. We don't need to flee and panic because our faith is in you. And so, Father, we thank you for all of this, and we pray this in Jesus' name.